Hello and welcome to the Rainbow Roundtable Golden Anniversary Retrospective. I am Heather Booth. I'm the audio editor at Booklist and we are so glad you're here. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. Links to the Rainbow Roundtable resources and today's slides were included in the reminder email that you received from Zoom about an hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also ask for these links in the Q&A and we'll send them to you. If you have any trouble at all, please contact us at webinars at booklistonline.com. The audience is in listen only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or if you need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we will pass along any other questions that you might have to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned earlier. From there, you can select show or hide captions from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable captions, you can adjust the size of them at any time by selecting captions settings. And finally, Booklist expects all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates this standard of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may, at the discretion of the organizers, be immediately removed from the webinar. We are honored to partner with ALA's Rainbow Roundtable for today's event and are looking forward to their presentation. So without further ado, I'll introduce today's moderate, moderator, Dantene McPherson-Joseph. Dantene is a collection management librarian at the Oak Park, Illinois Public Library and the current chair of the Rainbow Roundtable. She has presented for Library Journal on inclusive collection development and diversity audits, and is an advocate for reading widely and diversely. Thank you so much for being here, Dantene. Take it away. Thank you, Heather. Um, I am, like I said, I'm Dantene, um, and I am very excited to be moderating this discussion uh, for the Rainbow Roundtable's Golden Anniversary. Um, and with me, I have some amazing, amazing um, Roundtable leaders. Um, first, we have Deb Sika, pronouns she, lay, is she, Deb is the Deputy County Librarian for the Alameda County, for Alameda County in California, um, a former chair of the Rainbow Roundtable and the current Merit Fund Promotion Committee Chair of the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable. We have Ann Moore, um, a retired librarian from the University of Massachusetts, a dedicated member of the Rainbow Roundtable, and also served as a chair um, and her knowledge of roundtable history is extensive and invaluable. We also have Dr. Rayanne Montague, who is an associate professor and the LIS program coordinator at Chicago State University. Um, in addition to her work with the Rainbow Roundtable, Montague has served as an ERP member for the American Library Association Accreditation Reviews and was a co-convener and co-founder of the IFLA LGBTQ plus user special interest group. And also a former chair of the roundtable. <laughs> uh, and then finally, we have Nadia Mira orozco Sahi, who is a library specialist, library information specialist, excuse me, at the University of New Mexico, which sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. Nadia is the incoming chair of the Rainbow Roundtable. Hello, everyone. Hi, Johnson. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Hey. Uh, thank you all for agreeing to do this with me um, and for taking the time to celebrate the Rainbow Roundtable's anniversary. Um, I know we originally, our official 50th anniversary was in 2020, and then everything happened. <laughs> so thank you for being here to do a, a much larger celebration uh, than even we had originally anticipated. Um, so let's get started. Um, let's, we're gonna start with some roundtable history. Uh, in our early days of the roundtable, we weren't actually always a roundtable um, and we didn't always have the name Rainbow Roundtable. And for, for uh, some information, some hist a little history lesson, 
Uh, we're going to turn to Anne Moore, who uh, is our resident historian extraordinaire. Um, when we first came into existence, we were the task force on gay liberation as a part of the social responsibilities roundtable, um, where our first coordinator was Israel Fishman, who is now the namesake of the Stonewall Nonfiction Award. Uh, can you tell us, Anne, what you know or have learned, or rather Anne have learned, about the early days of the Roundtable as a task force? Sure. Thank you. Um, Israel was persuaded by some of his friends and I think former library school classmates at Columbia University to form the task force in 1970 in Detroit at the annual ALA conference. So he did that. Um, and then a few months later, he realized he really didn't understand how he was going to move forward with that. I suspect he was job searching at the same time. And miracle of miracles, in December of 1970, Barbara Giddings, a gay activist who had been leading various um, protests and activism around gay rights for about 15 years, got a notice about the meeting, an, an upcoming meeting, and showed up. And quickly changed the scope of the task force. Um, within the next month, by the time midwinter was happening in Las Vegas, um, there was a, the first gay bibliography had been written. And none of them were attending, but they got copies to the conference. The first, their first participation at the conference was in Dallas in 1971, where Barbara had already designed the first um, Book Award, which became the, the Stonewall Book Award, and she named Isabel Miller's Patience and Sarah as the winner, which was republished as a place for us. They had their first program, Sex and the Single Cataloger, and perhaps most notable of all, they had the Hug a Homosexual booth in the exhibit hall, which drew a lot of attention to the round, to the group. There it is. We have that pic. We have some pictures of the Hug a Homosexual booth. Um, I re I remember these being some of the first photos of mm -hmm. the roundtable that I'd ever seen. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think it's really interesting because I read, I read, I, I read that no one actually came to that booth. Is that right? right? Yes. It was um, some CERT members, and in the picture you see Israel, and then Steve Wolf, and then Barbara and Isabel Miller um, kissing. So I understand that a lot of women from CERT helped keep it going. Well, shout out to CERT for yeah. you know helping us uh, being our, <laughs> our our first home um, because it, it was the 70s. Um, I, our official birthday is 1970, but like we said, 1971 is the first time we really had a presence at, mm -hmm. um, at ALA. Uh, do you remember, Anne, um, in your research, do you remember what, we, what was happening at that very first program, Sex in the Single Cataloger? Um, that was an attempt to get ALA and the Library of Congress to create positive subject headings for our books and um, change the call numbers. The call numbers for our books were, and, and the subject headings were all under sexual perversion. Mm -hmm. um, so by 1972, um, the HQ 76.5 um, call number status was created by Library of Congress. And so it happened fairly quickly to get a new area of, of um, call numbers, but the subject headings continue to evolve over the years. So that was their main thrust of that. Awesome, thank you. Um, and since the program Sex in the Single Cow and the Single Cow Blogger, uh, we've had a number of programs um, that we have you know, put on at annual, um, and we'll talk a little bit later on in the session about some programs that we have coming up at this annual in Chicago in a few weeks. Um, so we've done a lot of evolving over the years. We started with that very first name, Task Force on Gay Liberation in 1970. Then we changed the name in 75 to the Gay Task Force. Um, and then we did in like in the winter, as I was reading and doing my research and preparing for this, I learned 
Um, a couple of things about that, those, you know, early 80s, mid 80s kind of uh, transitional period where, you know, we changed the name again to the Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Uh, 1986 is also when we elected our first chairs. Um, up until mm -hmm. then, we just had coordinators. It was Israel Fishman and then Barbara Giddings. Um, and then in 86, we started having chairs uh, where we had uh, Dee Michelle as the first male co-chair and Ellen Greenblatt as the first female co-chair. Um, and within that, that's when we really started to see what would what we know now was the Rainbow Roundtable. That's when we started to see committees happening. Um, that's when we started changing you know, the kind of structure that we worked with. Um, and that's also when you start seeing the emergence of those highly anticipated socials uh, that we have at the January and June conferences. Um, and then we, we got roundtable status in 1999, um, and we, were, we became the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender Roundtable of the American Library Association. Um, and so if does anyone remember what it was like around that time to be in what was a task force that became a roundtable? Um, what changed upon achieving roundtable status? And if you weren't in ALA at the time, uh, or on the task force then, what attracted you to it? Um, and then I'll start with Anne and then we'll go to Deb and then uh, Dr. Mosquito. So I got involved, was appointed in 1998 to Stonewall. Um, so I was in New Orleans when those meetings had happened and vaguely aware of what was going on. Um, I think the real push was around us one, being able to be a roundtable gave us more recognition within invisibility and ALA. It also allowed us to um, control our own finances and perhaps most notably start our endowments. And so the success of the Stonewall Book Awards today kind of rests in the growth rests on us having a healthy and growing endowment. And none of that was possible as long as we were a task force. So. Um, as a Stonewall member, I was really focused on Stonewall and, um, you know, the, the bigger changes weren't um, as evident to me at the time. Um, I'm a turn of the millennium uh, roundtable person, I'll say. Um, uh, and I do, and the, the visibility within ALA is a, is a huge part of, I think, what we do. We're still doing that work. Um, especially since we recently just uh, with the new passing of the bylaws for ALA have established a rainbow roundtable position on the executive board of ALA, which was a huge victory for visibility for us. But um, I can talk to how we got rainbow roundtable. Um, I don't think I've ever told this story anywhere. It was kind of an internal process that happened, but um, it was 2016 um, and the Stonewall Awards. And there was an author there, her name, uh, her name was Libby Ware, and wrote a book called Lum. And Lum is about an eight-year-old that was diagnosed, um, in, diagnosed intersex. And, and the author was up there um, rece receiving the award, the honor award, and basically turned to us and said, you don't have I in your name at all. And so I remember us always having conversations about why it was GLBTRT and we would tell that's because that was the that was the arc of history those letters kind of lined up as as the scope of the round table became wiser and our understanding of ourselves and our community expanded and so um hearing that I was just kind of I sunk in my heart in so many ways. And so I was incoming um, at that awards. And so the next year when I was chair, um, I decided it was something that we needed to address. And so we started out on this three-year journey that definitely happened after the fact, after I had already cycled off chair and Anna Elisa had cycled into chair. Um, but we took a poll. We had many points for the membership to kind of give their opinion on what we should be called. I have to say my favorite, my favorite outside of Rainbow Roundtable was Unicorn Roundtable. That would have been quite an adventure we would have been on, <laughs> but uh, didn't, didn't prevail in the vote. And so I think it came down to Stonewall Roundtable and Rainbow Roundtable. And people just really wanted 
to get away from alphabet soup um, in some ways. Uh, and there was a good conversations around what does it mean to have the Q in there? Um, I think some people that remember the word queer as being offensive versus as a reclaimed term, those conversations came up around the renaming. And so when it came down to it, and it was a very close vote still, um, Rainbow Roundtable prevailed. And so we've been we've been named that ever since. And not to interrupt, I know Dr. Montague, we want to get your perspective as well, but that's what Deb is talking about is something that the Rain table, Round Table continues to do in trying to move towards inclusivity. We try to make sure that we honor name changes in things that have already been published. We try to make sure that we recently just had this conversation about the kind of connotation of queer because we're updating our bylaws and we're making sure that we're action oriented and that, you know, diversity is a, a fact, but in, inclusivity, inclusion is an act and it's an act that we are trying to perpetuate every day. And so that that progression and those conversations continue to happen and push the round table forward in I think all the right ways. I'll, I'll unmute and jump in and y'all please call me Ray. Um, I am similar to Deb in terms of my uh, time with the round table and uh, as, even as a librarian, I am a, a, a young librarian. I was a teacher for a while before I became a librarian. So uh, only around uh, 2000, that's as long as I've been doing things with, uh, with ALA and the round table. Um, and just to add one other small perspective about these um, conversations and this ongoing um, dialogue and you know the complexity of our name and inclusion and those sorts of things. I just wanted to have a, a shout out to our our listserv um, that we had previously. I know you know now we're all um, on connect and those sorts of things, but there there was a lot of really wonderful conversations that were happening there um, as well as as at um, actual meetings. So I think that was uh, a great way to to have the dialogue going on. You know, I remember those conversations. I remember um, getting the emails from both the listserv and also the survey that are like, oh, would you like our name to be? Um, and I remember being new to the round table at that point. And like, I don't know what our name should be. It's, it should be, it should, it should be something that represents us all. And I remember being very excited to be like, haha, rainbows. That's who we are. That is our thing. Um, so one of the things, or rather our mission that we chose to accept um, and continue to choose to accept uh, has deepened and changed over the years. Um, it started with wanting to tackle discrimination and discriminatory practices against LGBTQ plus people within libraries, within cataloging, um, improving the social standing of LGBTQ plus library workers, um, and it has grown really into a purpose that is rooted in providing, improving, and advocating for access to materials by and about LGBTQ plus people. We're also uh, dedicated to promoting LGBTQ plus library services and supporting other underrepresented groups. Um, would you say that over the last 50 years, uh, the Rainbow Roundtable has lived up to its purpose and in what ways? Um, and I think I'll go backwards this time. We'll start with Ray. Uh, and then move Nadia, Deb, and Anne. Uh, okay. Um, I think, um, you know, I was kind of reflecting between the, the history and the naming of the round table and also our mission. I think we, um, we certainly steadfastly work towards the mission. Um, and I think, you know, things have evolved a lot in the past, uh, of course, over five decades that, um, the, the group has existed. I mean, it, it's really interesting when I think about this in terms of library science and libraries. And of course, I'm a professor, so I always sometimes go back to, to Ranganathan and, and the five laws of library science and think about, you know, the library being a growing organism. And so, you know, how, how are we being proactive? How are we responding to things that emerge? Uh, but I think overall, um, the, the group is... Uh, you know, has been extremely dedicated and creative in, in addressing um, all the, the changes and challenges that have emerged. 
Yeah, I think, uh, so I've been reading over our mission a lot and these various iterations of it as I was looking at past letters and preparing for this just to see, you know, as far as we've come, there are a lot of things happening now. Um, the New York Times just published an op-ed this morning about we, we're in a state of emergency as a community. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of the things that the round table and the task force was originally slated to do is still really important work or once again, very critical work to safeguarding our communities, to safeguarding our information to access and our ability to live and work and exist openly. Um, one of our missions right now, one of our the things that the roundtable is tasked to do is to work towards eliminating job discrimination of LGBTQIA plus folks. <laughs> and that's something that we're seeing, you know, that it, it was a broad, not just library folks, it was a, we want to help our entire community, but we are seeing right now in a special push in libraries. Um, and that is, you know, I think in looking at where we started, it's great to see how much progress has been made, right? Like in, that bibliography that was published is something that I went to when I first was coming into my identity and was like, I don't know what I should read. That was one of the first resources I found. And of course, reading was the way I was going to figure these things out. <laughs> and then, you know, to see now we have, we put out book lists, we have a board, there's a plethora of things to read and things to watch and, and content, but that doesn't mean that our mission has become any less critical um, in finding what content serves us, where that joy can be found, and how we can safeguard and support our communities. And so I think um, that we are still trying to do the things that we initially set out to do. <laughs> that, that is so true. Um, and I think that is, I think we are here for, you know, the success and the joys but of our community, both within libraries and outside of libraries, but it's also that, you know, we, we are also here for the sadnesses. For the for the angry times, um, and we want to be uh, knowledgeable and responsible and responsive um, to both the things that you know people join. Like these are the reasons that people join our roundtable, um, and I think it's important to keep you know that mission in mind in all of the work that we do across like all of our committees. Um, Deb. Yeah, it's, that's true, Dunstan. I think it's there's been points of high joy and points of pain um, through the whole arc of history, um, for sure. You know, just I think part of the um, reason that I was pulled um, towards the mission of what we were doing with Roundtable was um, I uh, myself went to the public library to find terminology. It wasn't we didn't have social media. We didn't have all of all of these things. I went to World Book and my friendly neighborhood librarian showed me the G volume and helped me cross-reference to the L volume where I found lesbian and I finally had a word to describe myself. And so there was, there's lots of stories like that of, of people early, early days or mid days of the arc of history for the round table that the pain was very close. I mean, and it's still very close to many people. Um, before the cataloging changes, I remember looking for nonfiction materials between prostitution and pedophilia. That's kind of where we where we hung out in the nonfiction um, Dewey Decimal System, and and also that area of the of the library being peppered with hate flyers. And so, not just being able to take out materials. Um, but having to go through being fragile and going through a gauntlet of hate to get to intellectual freedom and accessibility. And so, you know, all of that to have pure joy and, and do amazing things, but also to have, you know, we had the pulse shooting when ALA was in Orlando, and that was another, you know, serious time for the round table. Our members um, prevailed and they showed up and they showed out, not unlike they did in Dallas in 1971. Um, when, you know, we were in a place that wasn't welcoming. And so I do feel like there is a vigilance that has to be held by us um, and all of us and all, all of the 134 people on this call. Um, there's, there's a vigilance that happened because we are nowhere near where we could be. And our expansive definition continues to open up 
And I, I just love where, I mean, Dantene has taken us. She is a fearless, our fearless leader right now. And, and, and Nadia is coming in as fearless leader. And I just feel very hopeful and very proud of what, what we're doing. And I know that um, there's lots of support for us. So we'll, we'll be okay. We'll be okay no matter what happens. Very true. Uh, Anne? Um, I just want to expand on something that Deb talked about with the arc of history and that first um, listing under the general and the um, statement of purpose about the repeal of laws which oppressed the homosexual. Um, at that time, Barbara Giddings was also leading a fight to get the American Psychiatric Association to remove homosexuality from the diagnostic statistical manual. It was treated as a mental illness. Um, so she was fighting that on two fronts that, you know, creating a positive um, atmosphere through her work with ALA and trying to get the Psychiatric Association to update. Um, also at that first conference, they were um, fighting um, because a member had been, um, had a job offer rescinded from the University of Minnesota when he and his, his boyfriend partner applied for a gay marriage license, uh, for a marriage license. Um, and so he was fighting to say, can you force the University of Minnesota to change their, um, their mind? So in some ways, having the news about a librarian being fired for being queer now um, is kind of like we're unfortunately back um, to that place. Um, so I think that's all I have to say about it. Thank you. Yeah, I think... I think we spend, at least I know I do, I, I spend time going through um, the articles and paying attention to the conversations that are currently happening in the round table, um, both because I feel like it's my responsibility as, um, as the chair of the round table right now, but also uh, as a member of, a li of the library community. Um, and it's, there's a lot going on and it can be, discouraging, um, but also I, I wanna remind all of us, like as our panelists and all of the folks watching us, there is there is hope there. There is um, there's work being done behind the scenes. Um, there is work going on in your communities um, that you can reach out to. Um, it, it can feel daunting, but you don't have to be discouraged entirely by it. Um, and so I think our next slide starts uh, some memories. Aha, the Oral History Project. Um, if you have never heard of the Oral History Project, the Oral History Project was something that was begun in, I believe, 2018, um, in the run-up to what was supposed to what was our official 50th anniversary in 2020. Um, and we will have a link for you for all of your participants that go straight to the Oral History Project and you can read because we have them as transcripts or you can watch uh, videos from many of the members that we have here on this call, but also others who are, you know, who were involved in, um, in the round table um, and also some, some early, early, early members. Um, and it's fascinating and eye-opening uh, to, you know, really hear this history from, like, from the people who were there. Um, and I, I want to encourage you all to, you know, go and read and watch. Um, and I would like to invite any of our panelists, um, if you have any memories related to the Oral History Project, because it did start as an emerging leaders project. Um, what would you like to share? What would you like to encourage our, our participants uh, to know about the Oral History Project before they dive into it? I'd just like to throw out that they should definitely go check out all the links and then go back in a couple of weeks when um, we get Ann Moore's interview up there because it's not up there yet, but you'll be able to see her, her beautiful face up there soon. We're, we're going to make that happen. <laughs> Ann or Deb, I know Ann, like I said, we're going to get you in there. Um, but do you have any thoughts that you would like to share on like the journey of getting to having the oral history project? Um, 
Sweet. <laughs> go ahead, Deb. Oh, I was gonna I was gonna let you go, Anne. <laughs> what I, I can say though is um part of uh Rainbow Roundtable's um space in ALA is also to be integrated with um, things like Spectrum Scholars and with Emerging Leaders. And the fact that this grew out of our Emerging Leaders um, connection um, really does speak to the fact that we have space and we have we have place in our professional organization. Also, I just to point out too that um, Rainbow Roundtable or back in the day when it was Task Force is actually the first professional LGBTQIA organization mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. that's something mm -hmm. incredibly special um mm -hmm. there are so many now various queer roundtables in all sorts mm -hmm. of professions but the fact that the librarians um got it together first is pretty amazing so uh definitely uh I think we should we should hold that part of our history um closer to the surface than we do mm -hmm. yes and then Anne I was just going to say that um, my oral history was scheduled and I was at work and that was the day I discovered that my desktop didn't have a camera. <laughs> and um, and then the COVID happened. So um, we will get to it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. Ray, do you, would you like to share anything about um, the oral history project um, as it stands um, about the journey to like getting the oral history project going because I believe you that was one of your like your early early times. It, it was it was happening when when I was chair. Um, but I just wanted to echo uh, you know what Deb was saying in terms of uh, having folks like the emerging scholars involved or and working across um, some of the different uh, groups within ALA. You know that's something else that's happened um, over the period that I've been involved and in, and in working with different roundtables, certainly um, someone said social responsibilities who, you know, helped launch the, the whole um, task force. Um, but, you know, A ASL and, and PLA and, and other groups as well. Uh, I, I think that when we have these kinds of um, collaborations, uh, we can, can have really wonderful outcomes. Um, we're also involved with the Spectrum Scholarship and um, so it's, uh, I, I just, I would encourage everyone to check it out because the stories are fantastic. Um, but it's, uh, like I say, sort of a testament to the, uh, the great things that happen through collaboration. And, and just to add to that, I mean, I think it's a touchstone for me personally to see, I went to any, any um, historical documentation of kind of where, what we've been through and where we are now belongs to all of us. Um, I recently went to San Francisco Public Library and they had some of the original task force newsletters. And to just be in the presence of those newsletters and to know that there was, we are all very busy professionals. We have personal lives, we have professional lives. Many of us give up Pride Weekend to be, to go to ALA Annual, um, to not be with our immediate family and friends. Um, and so there's a lot of energy and, and wherewithal. And sometimes when we get um, bogged down by the amount of fight that we have ahead of us, I look back on the history pieces and I just say, they did it. And they did it in a time where we were criminalized. Um, they did it in a time where, um, you know, it was the end of your career if you if you were to say so. And I just I just use that as my 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 personal touchstone or grounding point for for to understand our history. And I think that's true for for many oppressed communities is to understand what we've battled in the past to know and have the energy to what we have to battle in the future. You know, I'm just I'm sitting here thinking Sunday I'm going to our drag story hour. And we'll be faced with all kinds of protests, and this is the Bay Area, and, and we still will have that. But then I look at Barbara Gettings in this picture with a twinkle in her eye, and I'm like, yes, sister, we can do this. <laughs> so I think it's important for us to know that history and to have that that touchstone, too. So, uh, Yes, I agree. Um, and it's interesting that you are going to a drag story hour, um, because part of a, a large part of drag is the performance of it all, the camp of it all. And um, I believe our next slide will show this, 
At annual in 1977, we had a, there was a gay rights puppet show in the exhibit hall. Um, <laughs> with the flaming fundamentalist meets, I'm not gonna say the F word, but meets the football uh, with paper mache hand puppets of Anita Bryant and David Copay. Now I was not around in 1977, this predates me. And I'm very curious if anyone knows the story behind this, like the rest of the story behind this picture, because it was so surprising. Um, now, a lot of these pictures are gonna be from the ALA archives, which are um, held by the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Um, and it's very fascinating to go through these pictures because you find things like this, that we had a, we had a whole puppet show and it's like, we had regular programs, but then in the exhibit hall, we had a puppet show. And I see you're unmuted. <laughs> so 1977 was when Anita Bryant was campaigning um, against to have um, um, an, a discrimination, an anti-discrimination ordinance um, repealed in Miami-Dade County. And the task force got ALA to pass a um, job protection, an, an anti-discrimination um, job um, bylaw or ordinance at the same time, at that same year. Um, also at that year, I think David Cope was the first, probably former NFL player to come out as gay. Um, so this was Barbara Gettings' creativity um, on full view. How can we make light of this and get some publicity out of it? And we're going to, you know, we're going to do this puppet show with Anita Bryant. The actual puppets are in the um, archives in, in New York at the New York Public Library, like the, oh, wow. the paper mache puppets themselves. That is, that is worth a trip to New York, all on its own. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, well, and, and I would also just chime in a little bit in terms of the context and how popular puppets were, right? In the mid 70s, like this was just huge. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. I can just imagine Barbara saying, well, of course we need puppets as well and, and uh, you know, charging ahead with it. I mean, I think it's really fascinating. I think it's also a, like a, there's shock value in puppets. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And also everybody loves a puppet show. Everybody loves a puppet right, show. Right, right. It's it fun. It, it, it's taking it, uh, you know, it's redirecting through a different kind of media. Absolutely. I mean, that crowd looks engaged, for sure. Well, we can only see the back of their heads, so I have no idea what their facial expressions are, but they are—they do look like they are staring intently at. It was definitely people. a bottleneck in the exhibit hall. You can see, because <laughs> it's hard to get through crowds in exhibit hall, and they were standing in their space to see that puppet show, so. <laughs> through that. Um, so Debbie brought this up already that, Annual conference, ALA annual conference does very much often fall on Pride weekend. Um, and one of the things that people might not know um, is that the round table has walked in a lot of parades. Uh, there's a photo here for 1992, the San Francisco Pride, and then uh, San Francisco again in 2015 during marriage equality or rather when the marriage equality decision came down, I wonder um, if it, like these next couple of slides are memories of the round table um, told in photos, both at Pride and in other places. Um, and I I wonder if you guys, y'all would like talk through them a little bit um, because I see up in the corner, we have one from New Orleans also. I can talk a little bit about it because it, 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 do, it does, I, I do get um, a little disheartened going because I am committed to ALA, I'm committed to Rainbow Roundtable and intellectual freedom. And I don't, I'm not with my wife of, of 23 years or 20, 24 years now, um, every time that we have annual conference. And so the time that we were in San Francisco for, for marriage equality, um, my wife and I had just left Texas because Prop 8 was overturned in California. 
And so basically we sold every possible thing we could sell to get ourselves westward and be, be protected by the California Marriage Acts. And so the next year afterwards is the year that we went, um, we went national. And so I had never had um, a more beautiful experience or coming together of experiences uh, beyond that San Francisco pride. That was such a huge year for us. And being able to be here where, where I live in my home with my wife at ALA, marching with my lesbrarian t-shirt because it's one of my favorites <laughs> um, with a group of other of other fellows other other folks that had been walking the path along it was an absolutely incredible experience and um i think you know even people that are on this call if you can assemble a group to march in your own pride parade um it's just a tenfold effect so it, it really was quite an amazing um historical year So these next photos uh, are courtesy of Ray um, and funny story. So I, if you look down in the corner, like in the bottom center uh, where it says Barbagating Gay and Lesbian Collection, that was the social during the Philly Free or during Philadelphia at the Philadelphia Free Library. Um, and I remember I'm not in this picture, but I found the picture that I am in for this conference uh, or for this social. And I remember that being a very exciting night, um, just being in the library, being surrounded by just ha like positive gay energy. <laughs> um, at the Barbara Giddings Library, remember that? Yeah, we were yes. there in, in her namesake, yeah. I think our socials in Philadelphia have always been or are usually at that library, the Philadelphia Free Library, uh, Independence Branch. Um, and it was at that social in 2003 that Barbara Gettings came and I was introduced to her and she charged me with learning the history of the group. And two weeks later in the mail, I got a full set of her bibliographies and I Really, at the time, I was working in access services, and I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do with these. So I tucked them in my bottom drawer. Um, but that's where she charged me with, you know, somebody needs to know this history. Um, so it was fun going back there a few years ago at that event. Um, you still have them, right? That. Oh, I still have them, and <laughs> I know there are copies. Well, I sent you a link to one of them. Um, I know there are copies in the ALA archives, but yes, I still have the folder. Awesome. And all the, the stuff that we're talking about and um, any pictures in the archives, I know we're we're collecting links and we're going to send it to, to everyone watching now. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then, Ray, you have this really cool picture up in the in the corner um, that is yourself, uh, a Rainbow Roundtable member, Lisa. I don't know who the person standing next to you is, but in the green shirt is our President-elect Emily Drabinsky. That's that's Anne. That's Anne yeah. next to me. That was that's the me. most recent. That was in DC. Yes. I didn't go to DC. And it looks like your hair is so much shorter in that picture than it is now. <laughs> that's why I didn't recognize you. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, next slide, please. It just, I, I also just that, wanted to, oh go oh, ahead, sorry. Ray. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I was just gonna give a shout out to the to the Zoom meeting because. When I was chair, you know, we were in COVID lockdown, and so we did we did have a lot of Zoom. That was a, that was a social, also a Zoom social. You can see maybe a little bit of dancing, a little bit of silliness in that gathering. Mm -hmm. That's right. I and remember just, that social. I don't think I was in that room because I remember either you or Kathleen had breakout rooms during the social, um, during the virtual social, um, and those and were some really fun times. Just to mention Emily and the fact that um, her presidential, um, she's incoming president now of the American Library Association. I want to acknowledge the fact that it is 2023, 2024 year, and it is the first time we've had a very highly vis visible, publicly out um, uh, lesbian president or any anybody from our community to be publicly out. 
And that is, I mean, 53 years later, and we finally got a president that represents um, our round table. And I just think it, it is something that we can't lose sight of. It is a huge um, benchmark for us. And the fact that Emily is carrying a lot on her shoulders, so please help her in her year. But um, it, it just, to, just to acknowledge the fact that it is a long time coming, but we, we're finally there. Oh yeah, I anticipate Emily going to like hitting the ground running, ready to work. Um, not that she hasn't; she's been doing like a ton of work in her president-elect year. Um, but that, I think that main year, which I am learning, the main year is uh, a lot of work. There's a lot of things that you have to do uh, during your your year in in power. <laughs> um, so we have some other photos of you know being at socials, being I think one of these photos is of the of an award. Uh, we have sorry, yes. these are these are from over several different years and I'm mm -hmm. trying to think about which locations we were in I I think Orlando that one the bottom with Dale and, and Lisa I think that's uh, mm -hmm. that was Orlando but sometimes it's I don't I'd have to go back and, and take a look or or we can see when fat Angie won uh, that's the book there in the in the center at the bottom. I uh, mm -hmm. have to go back and, and take a look with at it. That was in the middle of there. That was 2026 with it was Peter's year, I think. Or and I just want to shout out that Roland is in the audience and he's featured in this picture. And Roland yeah. is definitely one of the giants whose shoulders that mm -hmm. we're standing upon. So hey Roland. Hi Roland. <laughs> Hi. Um Thank that you. middle one in the top um, is the year I think we all got our library folks t-shirt. Um, Casey's in there. Yeah. yeah. Yay. That's awesome. Um, I hope you all are enjoying these, this, this walk down memory lane um, because <laughs> I know I am. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> and thank you, Ray, for adding all of these those lovely pictures. Um, so we're going to go, we're going to talk about some resources that the roundtable has right now. Um, I don't know if you all have seen, um, not just our panelists, but um, our uh, participants, um, the annual uh, Rainbow Book Month uh, proclamation. It happens every June. It's one of the roundtable's um, initiatives where we really like to highlight and promote LGBTQ authors and writing. Um, and I want to know, well, not no. I don't want to know because I already know. We we love doing this stuff. Um, promoting of LGBTQ plus materials is always is, is one of our founding like official goals, right? Um, and we've promoted thousands upon thousands upon thousands of books. Um, and it started with that gay bibliography from Barbara Giddings, which had thirty seven titles on it originally. And then when it finished its run, it was there were five hundred and thirty six titles uh, on that last. Gay, a gay bibliography, um, and I want to, I want to brag on the roundtable a little bit because when that number five hundred and thirty six is like the minimum number of titles that is read across um, just our booklets, not even the Stonewall Award committees. That's just the minimum number of titles being read across Rainbow booklets and over the Rainbow booklets. So. Um, I think there is power in having had, you know, just having had started with 37 um, and giving this push, this award that we've given uh, nearly every year since 1971 um, that really told publishers, you know, we want this. Readers want these kinds of, want these books, they want these resources, they want to know these authors. Um, and I think, you know, that's really cool. Um, both us as a roundtable um, and speaks to our power, our power and our presence in uh, the literary community. Um, and then we also have, you know, that that Stonewall Book Award, which started out as being called a gay book award, uh, where our first one was went to uh, a place for us by Isabel Miller, which used to be called Patience and Sarah. Um, and I want to talk about the growth of the Stonewall Book Award. I know that several of us have uh, served on it. Um, the pictures that you'll see down here, which again, you'll get in a list, um, are this year's um, Mike Morgan and Larry Roman's awards for children's and youth literature. Um, 
But this started as just one book, one award, and now we give five, three awards across uh, five categories with the potential for 20 books a year to be recognized. I think that's amazing. Um, and I'm wondering um, if our panelists would tell us if you have any memories of the Stonewall Book Awards, both either the award ceremony itself or um, maybe a short blurb about why you should become a roundtable member to apply to be on a Stonewall Award Committee. Let's start with Amy. I actually remember um, when Dantene was a part of the Stonewall Awards. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that the executive board uh, likes to do or used to do is, is during what's now LibLearn X, but at the time was midwinter. Um, when some of the um, the the, the lock-in is happening, where they're uh, debating all kinds of book titles and whatnot, and uh, I remember we were very careful to knock on the door because it is a very confidential process. It is a very honored and time and true um, process. And so, but I remember knocking, and I hear Michael scream hide the books <laughs> and then i just people scrambling in the room to make sure that not even the the you know past chair incoming chair and actual chair of of the round table were witness to any of the books um and and and, the, and privy to the discussions and i just thought this was just such a it was the energy around the love of the books i know you know there's there's just a lot people that get onto these committees first of all, are amazing speed readers. There's so much volume um, that they go through and they're so determined, but I have never, I, I, I actually have not done this, but I have never heard somebody say, oh, I wish I wasn't on this committee. People that are there absolutely enjoy um, the depth and the breadth of the experience. And so, and I also feel like if you're looking to get into Roundtable or trying to find that, that conduit in, being on any of these of these groups, whether or not it's your genre or cup of tea is a, is a wonderful experience. And it's a nice way to kind of toe dip into roundtable work, so. I, I agree. Um, I think it's, I don't remember that day that you're talking about, Deb, but I do remember a different day uh, during my year. I don't remember where we were. Um, but I definitely remember throwing a scarf over the books because the chairs were coming. And I just, I threw a scarf over the books and it was like, no, y'all can't see. You told us that we have to keep this secret. So uh, we were keeping it secret and keeping it safe. <laughs> I don't know if either of you or the three of you can speak to um, the changes that happened when we launch the um Mike Morgan and um the the why the YA children's award and joined the youth media awards and that whole veil of secrecy that was there where the rules changed that we couldn't we were used to announcing the book winners at the social and with that category of books there could be no leaks and everyone had to be um very private about what the what the titles were. And I'm sorry that Lisa Johnson can't be here to talk about that because she was Stonewall Chair the year that happened and did a, such a superb job of shepherding that that through. I think she's in the room, actually. Yeah. I'm sorry. She yeah, can't she jump is. in and speak. Yeah. Yeah. She is here. Shout out to Lisa, too. <laughs> um, so what was super cool? Well, no, I won't, it, it is super cool to be on any of these committees, but I will say that um, so the veil of secrecy had already come down when I started, or when I became uh, mm -hmm. chair of the yeah. Barbara Giddings Committee. Um, so it was it was already there, um, but it was something that like we take very very seriously. Um, and I'm going to read a comment from the Q and A because we know that Lisa's in the room. So Lisa, I hope you're not mad if I'm saying that this is what you're telling us. <laughs> um, uh, so that. It was in 2011 and when we went to the YMAs for the first time. And uh, that's actually all I should about. Lisa, do you have anything else to share about um, being in that committee? Please send it to us and then we'll 
do a little she, short. She does thing. say, Dante, that it was the Stonewall Committee in 2001 to 2003. Um, that was the beginning of her involvement in Roundtable. And she met some of her dearest friends. <clears throat> Just saying, <laughs> um, uh, through the committee services work. Um, back then, it was one committee for two awards, and we spent a lot of time together. And Dale, Roland, um, Cecil. So, so one thing that you will learn in the roundtable is that we are all really great friends. Um, it's, we have really great relationship building uh, across the committees and across like all of the work that we do. Um, and you will become very, very close with your uh, committee members, especially if you're on a Stonewall Award because of that whole being locked in a room um, and not allowed to talk to anybody else <laughs> for a little bit of time. <laughs> I would just echo what um, Lisa had written in her comment that some of my longest term um, roundtable friends, Lisa, um, Steve Stratton, um, Cecil Hickson, who has passed, were on the Earl Stonewall Book Awards with me, and I very soon after met Dale and um, Roland, who weren't on the committee with me, but I got to know them through that. It's it's a great way to get started in the roundtable, um, and what I caution you not to do, what I did was I moved twice during my time on Stonewall, and the second time when I was having movers, the only thing I was taking in my car with me were my cats and the books I had to read. Um, because it was December and, um, you know, the awards were coming up way too soon in January. Moving during an award year is very difficult. So shout out to you for doing it twice, Anne. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our Open to All Toolkit, which was most recently updated in 2022. Um, this is going to be, I don't know if anybody else remembers this, but I actually have one of those from the very first time. From the very first one we did in 2016 and in it you know we have um some information for people who are trying to serve the lgbtq community in their libraries uh, with their library resources um with their you know in the work that they do um and i encourage everyone to you know really kind of go look into it dig into it um and then you know send us questions if you have any um and I believe our next slide is asking about the future. So it's been 53 years, you know, 53 years of progress and hard work. Uh, what are some of your hopes for the future of the roundtable? Um, what do you think the next 50 plus years will bring? We'll start with Ray. Um, well, I really appreciate the, the growth in all kinds of different directions. And, and not all of that is, uh, easy to predict which ways we might be going through. I'm sure there will continue to be some challenges. Um, I the, the diversity that has been emerging in uh, literature over the past few years and the intersectionality um, in, in many of the titles is, is really amazing. Um, so I am looking forward to seeing that um, continue. Um, and so like, for example, I was going to mention um, Kape Ma, who uh, which is a recent winner, and um, Lessa, the current or the upcoming ALA president, uh, is going to be featuring um, the author of that as a, uh, as a presentation at ALA in Chicago. So looking forward to seeing everyone in Chicago. And, um, and yes. Awesome. Um, so weirdly, we are running up on, on uh, some time constraints. Um, it wouldn't be a book list webinar if we didn't give you some books. So uh, uh, Ray just talked about Kapai Mahu by Kina Le Moana Wong Kalu, Dean Hamer and Joe Wilson. Um, we also have some other, you know, favorite reads. Um, I'm just going to read them from the list that I have. And then we're going to have a list for you all for later. Um, Stone Butch Blues. Uh, we have Azami, A New Spelling of My Name, which are some of the favorites of our panelists here. And then also a queer love story, the letters of Jane Rule and Rick Bebout. Bebout, Bebout. I'm pretty sure I'm saying that wrong, and I'm so sorry. Um, the Lost Prophet, Bayard Rustin, and the Quest for Peace and Justice in America, um, Odd Girls and Twilight Lovers, and then The Great Believers. Um, so we're gonna have these for you at the when you get your uh, follow-up email, um, because again, it's not a book list webinar without a book list. Um, 
And I'm just going to take it back because um, to this slide, just if you're going to be in Chicago, if you're going to be in the area, these are some <laughs> of the things <laughs> uh, that will be going on. There are also a lot of author signings. They'll be at booze. Uh, it was, they just were not all going to fit on the screen, but there's a lot of great stuff happening. Um, and are, is everyone here going to, Anne, Ray, De or is everyone going to be there? And we'll all be there. So you can come talk to us and hang out. And we're, yeah, I, like people were mentioning with the book groups and the committee, we're like, we're friendly people, typically. <laughs> and uh, a great part of becoming involved is just jumping headfirst into this community and like immediate support and camaraderie and just like overwhelming love um, that you get from, from working with these people. So please come hang with us. Yes, if you need to find us specifically, you can find us at the four o'clock Saturday, June 24th annual membership meeting, um, or you can come to the Stonewall Book Awards and we will all be there. I, I will definitely be there. Um, if you have any questions that you want us to answer, um, we did see your questions. I'm so sorry that we can't get to them today, but we will, uh, you know, answer them um, for you all individually later. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I'm going to turn it back over to, thank you to my panelists first. Um, I really appreciate you all uh, hanging out with me uh, with Booklist today, this afternoon. Um, and now I'm going to turn it back over to Heather. Thank you so much, Dantanay, and thank you all. This was a wonderful celebration of the golden anniversary. There were so many wonderful comments and questions. We'll be passing those along to the panelists. I think, that, and there were a few um, specific questions related to the presentation that I think we could um, we could get answers to those to send out in the email um, follow-up. I think everybody would, would appreciate that. But thank you all for attending this webinar. Thank you for sharing your memories. Um, as a reminder, all registrants, everyone who is here today, even if uh, you didn't have a chance to attend today, you will receive a copy of today's video recording, the slide presentation, and the Rainbow Roundtable resources that we were just talking about in tomorrow's email. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, please join me in thanking our fantastic panelists once more for such a thoughtful, thorough, inspiring presentation. And we look forward to seeing you all at annual and um, sharing with you afterwards. This concludes today's webinar. See you next time.